What is the most painful thing you have ever experienced? I know what you mean. I had 850 degrees Fahrenheit water hit the back of my neck, third degree burns from my neck to my waist. The process over the next few days was crazy. The burn pain was immediate and the shock. Adrenaline puts it out if your mind. Kidney stones are worse. I get them every 4-6 weeks and they're brutal. The pain feels like someone hitting you with a hot axe. It builds to a level that doesn't seem to have a cap. I dislocated my foot once and tore all the vertical ligaments across the outside of my ankle in the process. I was told that breaking my foot would have been better because they could have done something for me. I had already popped it back into place so I was told don't walk on it and sent on my way. All the pain of a break, with no cast, no nothing. My right ankle is still almost twice the size of my left 15 years later. I broke my ankle when I was a teen. Walked on it for a month because my parents were insistent I just sprained it. Nope. Bottom of my foot turned black from the pooling blood. I was a candy striper volunteer at the local hospital and showed it to a doctor once. They told me I should see a ortho doctor about it. I couldn't do that until my parents took me. So I just stuck my white nursing shoes on and did my rounds. I woke up during surgery on my hand. My palm was all pinned back and there were several interns standing around the surgeon explaining what he was doing. I remember listening for a moment, looking at them standing there and then I looked at my hand, which I couldn't see as well because I was laying down. I asked them if I could see it too. The shock in all their eyes was crazy. Surgeon said sure and knocked me out. The surgeon asked me after surgery if I remembered everything and I repeated what I saw. He seemed a bit disappointed that I could remember, but was glad I didn't feel anything. Note, anytime I have surgery now, I always tell them about waking up during hand surgery, just to ensure they know about it. This, NSFL is my leg after a ladder slipped out from under me when I was 3 meters above some tiles. Foot went through the ladder. Then I landed on it, popped right off and didn't want to go back on. The worst of the pain was after they got it back on and put it in a cast but I had to wait overnight for surgery. During the night it swelled up too big for the caster and basically for a few of hours felt like someone was slowly crushing my ankle in a vice. Not sudden, just slowly crushing it over hours. I was hyperventilating from pain and passing in and out of consciousness. Nurses finally took me seriously and called the surgeon who had them cut the cast off. Immediate indescribable relief better than anything I have ever experienced. My mate and I were riding push bikes when I was about 13. He did this gnarly jump off the ramp and smashed his nuts into the seat fell off crying. I laughed my ass off. Not even 30 seconds later I tried to show off doing the same jump. When I landed the pedal snapped and I smashed my nuts even harder into the upper frame tube of the BMX bike. Two mid-teen boys laying in the grass grabbing their balls in pain for about 5 minutes. I think that was the last time I got hit in the jewels. It's always those eyes dot 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 it's not the same degree of hurt. But my grandmother was essentially my mother growing up. She died back in the late 90s, as my female cousin has grown older with me. Now that she has a bit of age on her face, when she smiles it's with my grandmother's eyes. I'd never seen it before that one time and I almost fell the fuck over. It was like seeing a ghost. I hadn't seen those eyes in decades. Love is a permanent condition. It doesn't stop just because it goes unrequited or the person we adored has gone. All you can do is build your life up around that broken spot. It never stops hurting, but with time and conscious effort, there's more new life surrounding it than broken, painful life where that spot is inside you. You owe that to yourself. You owe it to your daughter. And you damn sure owe that to your wife. Who would have never wanted you to go on in pain? Grieving is life's way of saying time to build to you. My wife grew up with the best girlfriend. They were inseparable as young girls, teenagers throughout school, college, and continued into adulthood. Girlfriend got married, 
and had two children with her husband. I married into the situation, and we all became pretty much family. Their house caught fire while their kids were upstairs. Girlfriend went for the girl, husband went for the boy. He and the boy made it out. The pain of losing her and 10-year-old daughter was the worst thing in my life. And I can't even imagine how it is for my wife. They were going to be old ladies together. Edited for clarity. I had a dental abscess from the age of 9 21-ish, hands down the most painful experience of my life. I would have days in which my eye would be completely shut from swelling. Sometimes the pain and swelling would get so bad that the whole area became numb for me which was like a blessing in disguise. I feel this needs a little explanation. As a kid I indulged in too many sugar, killed one of my molars and it broke off just where the tooth protrudes the gum. Immediately went to the dentist but the dentist explained the procedure in such a horrific way that I was terrified of going back. I guess I decided that the excruciating long-term pain was the lesser of the two evils. I had no knowledge on the severity of infection in the area at the time. The pain went away for good for a number of years until one day I chomped down on something and it came back. By this time I thought fuck this again and decided to bite the bullet. Turns out it was triple rooted and had to be pulled out one root at a time. None of it was exposed so there was some cutting and a lot of pulling. At one point the dentist held my head down with one hand for extra leverage. Between the anesthetic and the pain I couldn't walk for 10-15 minutes after the procedure. Protect your teeth kids and don't put off a dentist appointment out of fear. I had a failed root canal which resulted in an infection under my tooth and into my jawbone. One morning I woke up in a slight discomfort, like maybe something was stuck in my gums. I didn't think too much of it until the next day. I woke up feeling extreme pressure and pain under my tooth. At this point I still thought it might go away, you know. You don't want to think about a costly health expense. I didn't eat all day because putting pressure on it hurt really badly. The next day I woke up in the most agonizing pain I have ever experienced. I learned that night that I clench my jaw when I sleep. The pain was so unbearable that just my molars touching together, like literally just making contact was enough to make me see stars. I ended up seeing an emergency dentist and having them pull my molar for nearly $500 dollars dollars I didn't have. I'm not suicidal nor have I ever been, but death legitimately seemed like a source of relief. I'll never forget the relief I felt when the dentist numbed my jaw. I burst into tears while we waited for the numbing stuff to fully set in. It was the first time in days I wasn't in uncontrollable and agonizing pain. I realized then how much pain I was really in the past couple days. I don't know what I would have done if my dad didn't help me pay for it. I truly think I would have died. The fact that dental work isn't covered under health insurance is a joke. The way the US takes care of its citizens is absolutely shameful. Decades ago, I had something going on W slash my bladder, so I needed a scope, which goes straight down the urethro tube. This was back before they had flexible ones, and the scopes were quite rigid. I was sitting calmly on the table in the doctor's office for the procedure and two huge guys walked in the room. I nervously asked the doctor what was going on. He replied they're going to hold you down. I was swearing at them through the whole ordeal. Edit 1. Wow. I just woke up to lots of votes and awards. My first awards Eva. Thank you. Edit 2. I'm not sure what's going on W slash the chat function. Please know that I am trying to send thank yous to the kind souls who gave awards. So in the days leading up to my great grandfather's passing hospice came and set him up at home. The first few days there he was having someone, typically my aunt, his daughter, hold a urinal up to him. When he started quickly declining but still a bit loose and my aunt started talking to him with his hospice nurse about getting a catheter put in because he was struggling to let anyone know when he needed to use the bathroom. He was pretty adamant that he didn't want it. But the hospice nurse told him it really was time as he was sleeping more and not waking up to go like he was. My aunt stayed with him holding his hand during insertion and he was yelling at her through the whole thing. Once it was in there my aunt was stroking his hair and just happened to ask instinctively there isn't that better? He looked at her and started yelling better, better, that better. 
OMG a cystoscopy, I've had this and it sucks. The nurse comes in and injects a turkey baster syringe full of lidocaine into your pee hole which burns like hell, then clamps your penis with something like a metal hair clip and just leaves you there covered in cold jelly. Then you get to just lay there and wait. Then they insert a camera the diameter of a sharpie up your dick, the lidocaine does little to help, all the way into your bladder. There's a sphincter it has to push past and that hurts like hell too. Then they inflate you full of water to expand your bladder to a point you think your bladder is going to pop. Worst medical procedure I've ever had. My mom's suicide, and walking in her room finding her body till the two-thirds minutes after she sat up on the side of her bed and put the barrel of a .22 rifle in her mouth and pulled the trigger on the phone with 911 and I'm told to ensure she's laying flat so I ask if it's okay to remove a pillow and bunched up blanket from under her head. They said yes. Her head turned as I pulled the pillow and blanket and almost the entire back portion of her head, skull basically fell off. The sights, sounds, smells and feelings will be forever burned into my memories. I had a tumor in my vagina that could only be described as hammock-like. I was young and going through puberty with only my dad raising me, put in a tampon and a trip one side off. Before they removed it, they did an ultrasound, the kind where they basically shove an 8 inch dildo inside of you. Then to numb it they had to put a needle inside of it as well. I've been through childbirth and not even that compares to the pain that I went through with that damn tumor. I lost my best friend two years ago, might as well have been a brother. We'd been close friends our entire life. Someone left me this comment when it happened and I thought I'd share. Alright, here goes. I'm old. What that means is that I've survived, so far, and a lot of people I've known and loved did not. I've lost friends, best friends, acquaintances, co-workers, grandparents, mom, relatives, teachers, mentors, students, neighbors, and a host of other folks. I have no children. And I can't imagine the pain it must be to lose a child, but here's my two cents. I wish I could say you get used to people dying. I never did. I don't want to. It tears a hole through me whenever somebody I love dies, no matter the circumstances. But I don't want it to not matter. I don't want it to be something that just passes. My scars are a testament to the love and the relationship that I had for and with that person. And if the scar is deep, So was the love, so be it. Scars are a testament to life. Scars are a testament that I can love deeply and live deeply and be cut, or even gouged, and that I can heal and continue to live and continue to love. And the scar tissue is stronger than the original flesh ever was. Scars are a testament to life. Scars are only ugly to people who can't see. As for grief, you'll find it comes in waves. When the ship is first wrecked, you're drowning. With wreckage all around you, everything floating around you reminds you of the beauty and the magnificence of the ship that was, and is no more. And all you can do is float. You find some piece of the wreckage and you hang on for a while. Maybe it's some physical thing. Maybe it's a happy memory or a photograph. Maybe it's a person who is also floating for a while. All you can do is float. Stay alive. In the beginning, the waves are 100 feet tall and crash over you without mercy. They come 10 seconds apart and don't even give you time to catch your breath. All you can do is hang on and float. After a while, maybe weeks, maybe months, you'll find the waves are still 100 feet tall, but they come further apart. When they come, they still crash all over you and wipe you out. But in between, you can breathe, you can function. You never know what's going to trigger the grief. It might be a song, a picture. A street intersection, the smell of a cup of coffee. It can be just about anything dot 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 and the wave comes crashing. But in between waves, there is life. Somewhere down the line, and it's different for everybody, you find that the waves are only 80 feet tall, or 50 feet tall. And while they still come, they come further apart. You can see them coming. An anniversary, a birthday, or Christmas, or landing at O'Hare. You can see it coming, for the most part and prepare yourself, and when it washes over you, you know that somehow you will, again, come out the other side, soaking wet, sputtering, still hanging on to some tiny piece of the wreckage, but you'll come out, take it from an old guy, the waves never stop coming, 
and somehow you don't really want them to, but you learn that you'll survive them and other waves will come, and you'll survive them too, if you're lucky, you'll have lots of scars from lots of loves, and lots of shipwrecks. My big brother shooting himself in the face, he survived and I visited him in the hospital. His whole head was covered with bandages that were saturating through and he was cold to the touch. That memory is a knife that never dulls. Home life wasn't ideal and he is the only reason I made it through. He shielded me and did anything he could to make it less shitty for me. And I can't do anything for him now. Edit, oh boy I really didn't think this would even get noticed. I wrote it and went to bed. Sorry it was confusing to everyone it was hard to write. He did survive ultimately. He was cold but alive which was an odd dichotomy it felt like he wasn't really there. Especially since I couldn't see his face. It was a cold body with no face hooked up to all kinds of tubes and machines. He is alive but he isn't consistent with treatment or meds which is more what I meant when I said there's nothing I can do for him. I try to support him as much as I can but ultimately he's in a battle against himself. I'll let you know that he only lived because one of the barrels of the gun jammed so it kind of jerked out of his hands. Not entirely sure. The gun is still in an evidence locker somewhere. There are cops nearby that heard the shot and got him to a very nearby hospital. TW, death slash cancer slash trauma. So I lost my mother to breast cancer in 2015 after she had been battling it since 2009. It went into remission twice. The third time it came back it was stage 4 and there wasn't much to do. So my family just decided that we would live life a day at a time. We all knew she was dying but we put that to the side. We agreed that we would cross that bridge when we go to it. January had just begun and I had friends over like I oftentimes did. I was really close to all my friends and my parents were basically their surrogate parents. I came downstairs to make bacon and eggs for my friends and my mom was on the couch like she always was. The bed was no longer comfortable. My grandmother was there and said that my mother wasn't feeling good. So I got out thermometer and took her temperature. It was 85.4 degrees Fahrenheit. That was the moment I knew we had made it to the bridge. I helped get her some water and then made my way upstairs. My grandmother was taking care of her. I made it into my bedroom and I broke down. I closed the door and just collapsed onto the floor crying my eyes out and trying to calm down my breathing. My friends woke up and they instantly wrapped their arms around me. They knew about the cancer and that she was dying. This was something we were very open about. I explained what had happened. Eventually I was able to calm down enough to head back downstairs. My dad got home from working nights and I told him and he took my mom to the hospital to see the doctor. I was numb but I just had to focus on something. So I made the eggs and bacon for my friends. The next day my mother was in home hospice care. We had a hospital bed in out living room for her. On January 11, 2015 she passed in the early evening. It shattered my world and that was the most painful thing that I had lived through up until that point. I was only 18 years old. I ended up dropping out of high school because I was unable to focus on my studies. So I took a year off to focus on myself and learn how to live without her. Unfortunately for my family my father was also sick, but it wasn't visible to anyone not even himself. It wasn't until 2016 after I had graduated high school that he developed some almost flu-like symptoms. I promised him that I would finish my education and I kept that promise. Things weren't great for us. We still struggled with the loss. He tried his best to hide his pain from me, but I caught him more than once sitting at the kitchen table crying alone. My father was the type to put everyone else's needs before his own, sometimes to his own detriment but even then I can't fault him for it. He just loved to help others and being a good person was something he always was. My best friend was living with us at the time and that really helped us out emotionally. I thought it was the flu so I didn't think much of it. Eventually after about a week the symptoms got worse and he was clearly dehydrated. So I told him if he didn't get better I would force him to go to the hospital. He was stubborn and said give him a few days to get better. I relented and agreed to that. But the next morning he was even worse, that is when he agreed and I drove him to the hospital. 
They admitted him that morning and he stayed overnight. I was worried but didn't think much of it. I figured it was something that could easily be fixed or dealt with. How wrong I was about that. So the next day I'm with my friend in the living room just hanging out when I get a call from my father. He asks if I'm alone. I tell him that I'm with my friend and he asks to have the call on speaker. So I quickly put him on speaker and ask what is wrong and what the doctors are saying. The line goes quiet before he tells me that he doesn't know how to tell me that he has cancer. My friend and I just sat there for what felt like hours even though it was probably less than a minute. It was such a sobering moment that I really had no idea how to process let alone respond. 